All right, hello everyone. Um, it's three minutes after, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks so much for joining. Um, I'm very excited to be introducing Dr. Mika Tosca for our first seminar of the year. Uh, Mika received her BS in Mathematics and Statistics from the University of Connecticut, and then her PhD from a place you might have heard of, um, our Earth System Science Department here at UC Irvine in 2012. Uh, since then, she's worked for NASA JPL, mainly on the Miser Plume Project, and now as an assistant professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, so now I'll hand it over to Mika to talk to us about um, the intersections of art and science for solving the climate crisis. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, nice to see everyone virtually. I'm so sad that I can't be uh, be there in person. I uh, miss Irvine and UC Irvine dearly, and so I am really, uh, really honored and 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 thrilled to be giving this uh, presentation to you. So I am going to uh, share my screen so that we can um, start. So uh, the title of my talk is "Reimagining Futures: Collaborations Between Artists, Designers, and Scientists as a Roadmap to Solving." the climate crisis. Um, <clears throat> this is probably a different kind of talk than maybe you're used to um, in the department. And so um, I'm really curious uh, for feedback when we're done, uh, either today or in the future, um, on what you all think of that. And that's because I um, am a, a faculty, I'm an assistant professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, um, which means that I teach science to art students, to art kids, uh, not liberal arts, but arts. Uh, so like sculptures and painters and and that sort of thing. Um, and in my time at, at SAIC, um, I've been thinking about ways that scientists and artists can collaborate, not just in sort of the, the straightforward way, which is um, proper sort of improved communication of climate change, uh, but also in um, the uh, in uh, an improvement in the way in which scientists conduct science by collaborating with the artists and thinking about the art making uh, process. And so um, I wanna start with a, uh, a quote from Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower. Um, some of you may have uh, read this this summer um, as it recently uh, made it to the New York Times bestseller list uh, for the first time about 30 years uh, late, too late, but you know, it happens. Um, and the quote I think really captures kind of the motivation for why I approach this work and why I think it's so important that we do this. Um, so I'll just read it. The world is full of painful stories. Sometimes it seems as though there aren't any other kind. And yet I found myself thinking how beautiful that glint of water was through the trees. And so the themes for this work um, and the title of this Reimagining Futures is are thinking about what the next world looks like, what the, what the post climate change, what the post climate crisis, what our future world um, looks like. And, I, and, I, and I'm constantly sort of reminded on, by and draw upon themes from work like the sci-fi of Octavia Butler and other Afrofuturists who have thought about this world building um, of future worlds. And so you'll see how, how we get there. But before we get to the, the meat of it, normally I, um, I, do this, uh, I do this presentation in person. Um, so we'll see how this goes over Zoom. Um, but I wanna start with asking you all, what is nature? When you hear the word nature, what do you think um, is nature? First of all, are you a part of nature or are you separate from it? Um, I obviously can't ask for a show of hands, but I would imagine that most of you would argue that you're a part of nature. You're a, you're a person, you breathe, you're an animal. Um, and so therefore <clears throat> we are inherently part of nature. And then I would ask um, you all to list some words and things that you would identify as being natural. And you might say um, trees or uh, the sky or grass or rocks. And then I would ask you to list some words and things um, that you associate with the word unnatural. And you might say, um, you know, uh, capitalism and concrete and uh, plastic. Those might be things that you associate with the word uh, unnatural. 
So there's a cognitive dissonance here. We often view ourselves as being a part of nature. And yet, uh, when asked to, to describe things that are unnatural, we almost always say things that are created by humans. And so we've, we've definitely um, separated ourselves practically from nature. And yet, yeah, and so we've separated ourselves from nature. And yet, I, are, I would argue that this fundamental separation is part of the problem, right? Because we need to reimagine a world as one where humanity and nature coexist, where we are actually part of nature, really part of nature, and we can redefine the boundaries of what is natural and what is that unnatural. And I think this is how we can ultimately get to solutions to the climate crisis. <clears throat> Which brings me to the role of aesthetics and art and design and creative output, right? So I saw this poll actually, and I shoved this in here um, last night. I saw this poll by Pew, um, which asked Americans how they view scientists. Almost 90% of Americans view scientists as intelligent. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> that's good. We got something going for us. Um, but only 54%. Um, of Americans see scientists as good communicators. So this fundamental disconnect between uh, the, the public trusting scientists to be smart and the public viewing us as good communicators. In fact, 43% of Americans view scientists as socially awkward. Um, and so I think that these are all part of the same issue, which is that scientists are just notoriously not great at communicating the science that they're working on. Which brings us to uh, the idea of aesthetics. And so I'm just trying to try to shrink myself. Oops. Um, so how do I move my screen? My mouse is gone. OK, anyway. Um, this quote from David George Haskell's notes um, <clears throat> about ecological aesthetics um, really captures, I think, kind of the, 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 the essence of, um, of the problem. Hang on one second, I'm sorry. Am I like Zoom window? I'm like in the way. Okay, I'm just gonna shrink it down. <laughs> this is much better. Um, so the quote goes, once we collectively have an integrated sense of aesthetics, we can begin to discern what is beautiful and what is broken about a place. And from there, I believe, we can begin to form an objective or near objective foundation for ethical discernment. Answers emerge from the community of life itself, future through human experience and consciousness. The, the, sort, of, uh, the, the sort of layman's terms inter interpretation of this is that human beings are drawn to things that are aesthetic. Uh, we love well-designed, aesthetic, artistic even, creative things. And so connecting with uh, the human imagination is such an integral part of not only communicating science, but also doing science. Um, and so this is all really, uh, the, the challenge of doing this with respect to climate change is really embodied in this book by Timothy Morton called Hyper Objects, where he defines climate change as a hyper object, a hyper object being an abstracted object. Um, it's big, it's temporally large, it's, it's spatially large, it's difficult to really understand what is climate change as a physical sort of, as an object, right, as an aesthetic. Um, it, is an, it is an aesthetic and it is an object, uh, but it's difficult to grasp because of its size and its, and its sort of breadth. And so we call it, a, a Timothy Morton at least calls it a, a hyper object. And so while all people, and especially all scientists, encounter abstractions in our work, and climate change is sort of an abstracted object, right? Artists and designers in particularly intelligently address abstraction and create objects every day. They're really good at this. They're really good at tapping into the human imagination and connecting the human desire, um, the, the human uh, sort of captivation by uh, aesthetics. And so that brings me to some of the work that I want to show, some of the work that some of my students do. So I teach at an art school, um, which is really awesome because my students are so, so talented. My students and colleagues actually um, are so, so talented. And so 
Um, for my, 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 my main class that I teach, which is called Earth's Changing Climate, uh, for their final project, I ask them all to um, think about climate change, think about the things we discussed in the class, and then represent their research, their final research project, as both a paper and then an, an, as an aesthetic uh, artifact, as a creative um, artifact, a representation of, of what they're doing. And so I want to start with this one because it truly is my favorite. Um, and it's, it's titled Climate Deniers on Vacation. Um, it's a print by Katie Wittenberg. Um, and you can see um, it's, first of all, really wonderful to look at. Um, there are some um, hilarious <laughs> uh, people depicted here, Scott Pruitt, um, the Koch brothers, uh, uh, I can't even remember his name now, but the, the former CEO um, uh, of Exxon, they're sitting on uh, polar bears and behind them is uh, what looks like a mountain chain in relief, but is actually a depiction um, of the, I believe it is the uh, temperature record um, of Earth, right? So represented as like sort of an abstracted um, mountain range. So we're getting a lot of information, we're getting a lot of engagement, we're getting a lot of aesthetic engagement with this work. Um, it doesn't have to say that much, um, but it does a lot. Here's another one, um, which I have hanging in my house actually, um, called the Not So Great Wave. It's, it's depicting an inverted um, great wave, uh, which is a, is a very famous uh, silver screen print. Um, but of course, the colors are, are abstracted and there is a tin can representing sort of human uh, pollution, human influence on the environment in this wave, right? So that the, the great wave in 2020, so to speak, um, might look like this. Another really cool and interesting thing about this work is that it's what's it, the process that was that Noah used to make this um, this print is known as um, suicide printing, where you carve um, you know you carve a, a, a section out, you put the ink in it, you print it, and then that's it. You don't get to go back. And then you do another one, and you do a different color, and you and you move on until uh, you've reached the end, right? So you don't you don't get a do over. Um, and so that's like, you know, that has um, analogies and metaphors to the climate crisis uh, as well. Um, here are two more. I'm going to show you lots because I just think that they're amazing. Um, here on the left, we have a climate change quote by one of my students, Micah, and they're showing here kind of the intersection of um, uh, climate change and, and sort of uh, the Anthropocene and environmental disaster and how that um, plays is, is is related with and 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 um, interacts with various um, various things in our world, like gender identity, for example, and access to resources, and how those are both related to each other um, and related to climate change and natural disasters, right? Loss of resources, geographical location, denial of aid. It's all done um, in the in, as a quilt. Um, because we talk in my class about how the greenhouse effect is sort of like putting a blanket um, over the earth. So the depiction of a quilt is really important um, to communicating the message that Mika was going for, Micah was going for here. Um, on the right, um, we have what looks like a Nestle plastic water bottle, um, but it's made from glass um, by my student Kendall. And they actually used the plastic water bottle that this uh, mold was made from to form this totally useless uh, koozie, this white koozie um, over the top, right? It's a critique on, on our use of plastic, our overuse of plastic, um, and how that's contributing to our reliance on fossil fuels, the climate crisis, uh, et cetera. Um, art to me is more than just um, prints and paintings and sculptures, it's also um, a process as well. And so on the left um, is a final project by my student Mandy, and it's just a, a, a global warming rant, a rant about global warming on Snapchat. Um, and she had a whole like 20 uh, snap story about global warming and, and, and why it's important that we all um, recognize this. Most of my students are Gen Z. Um, and so Snapchat and Instagram and TikTok and these types of things really resonate with that uh, with that generation of, 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 of folks. And so this is a great way to sort of capture the attention um, of, uh, you know, a different generation, right? We're, we're, we're going after, we're going after different uh, demographics here. And then on the right um, is a really great video, which I, I don't think I have time necessarily uh, to play, 
but it's called Cake for Birds and Mothers. And um, in Chicago, we have uh, an endangered species of bird that nests along the uh, coastline of Lake Michigan. And its habitat is being destroyed by both climate change, um, the lake level has been rising and falling pretty dramatically in the last decade. Also the city itself um, and the surrounding suburbs have sort of eaten away at the habitat. And so my student actually made a cake um, for, the, for the birds um, with seeds that uh, she, she did the research and, um, and like sort of learned what, what uh, the diet of these birds was and, and why they might like this cake. And then she made this uh, honestly really cool video where she left the cake out all day and filmed it and some of the birds came um, to eat it and it was sort of like um, a love letter to to this endangered species of bird. We talk a lot in my classes about um, what it means that uh, humans have identified um, endangered species and, and, and why that's both important and also potentially like sort of a vanity project and um, it's and then how that plays with climate change and 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 stuff. So um, this video I really like, and if any of you want to see it, you can you can message me, and I will I will send you a, a shot of it. Here's a, a another example. It's a really bad picture. I'm, I'm unfortunately not an artist and a photographer myself, um, but uh, it's an untitled uh, piece. It's a poem um, about severe weather in the Midwest and how severe weather um, is likely to to increase um, due to climate change, specifically tornadic activity. Um, and other things. And so my student Ethan uh, wrote this poem, which actually can only be read if the lights are off and you're using a flashlight because it's, uh, it's been written in, uh, uh, sorry, you're using a black light um, because it's been written in a, in a specific type of ink that only black light uh, can see. And so of course, when there's a severe storm, one of the most common things that happens is that you lose power. So it's kind of tapping into multiple um, sort of aesthetic imaginations to, to tell us a really uh, an interesting story. Um, finally, we have two more images here. We have one on the left, which is um, images of a coral reef, but they've been corrupted. The JPEGs have been corrupted. Um, so the title of this piece is Negative Images. And this piece was actually made in collaboration with one of my students' seventh grade classes that she was shadowing and interning for. Um, they actually taught her how to corrupt these JPEG images. And of course, this is um, a very literal sort of um, aesthetic interpretation of how our coral reefs are, are suffering under climate change. And then finally on the right, we have a, a cartoon of how Venice um, is flooding uh, due to a number of human influences, one of them of course being sea level rise. And I actually also have this, um, this hanging in my apartment. So one of the really great um, things about being able to teach art students is that you get a lot of cool artwork hanging in your apartment and your office. Um, I also have, uh, one of my students made a, it corrupted a, the recording um, of Jimi Hendrix playing the national anthem at 1969 Woodstock. Um, and he, I'm not gonna play it because I don't think I have time, but again, if you wanna message me, I can send you the link for it. But he um, took the, the atmospheric record of uh, carbon dioxide concentrations and he fit a sinusoid to that and then layered it on top of Jimi Hendrix playing the national anthem in 1969. Um, and it creates by the end, this really like dysphonic, um, dystopic sounding uh, finale, which is kind of the, the, the point, right? It starts out uh, the national anthem and it, and it ends with the, just sort of a cacophony of noise. Um, again, sort of trying to very, uh, you know, aesthetically convey the, the problem with rising carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So this brings me to kind of the main, um, the main point that I wanna make here. So we've talked a lot about how um, aesthetics can be used as a way to communicate the climate crisis. Um, we know that scientists are, are not always the best communicators. Art is something that uh, can be used as a tool for better communication. I also, in working with artists and in thinking about the links between science and art, um, have also been thinking about how artists can not only communicate science better, but can also help scientists do science better. Um, and this is where I sometimes lose the scientists uh, in the audience. So uh, stick with me. So we've got 
this depiction of the scientific method. I know it's not perfect. No, the scientific method is not this linear process. We all sort of learn that. Um, but just to simplify things, we have kind of a hypothesis, which involves questioning and proposing and imagining things. And then we have the experimental phase, and then we have a conclusion, possibly um, a theory. The design and, and art making process is similar to the scientific method in that there is an ideation phase where you're exploring and you're imagining outcomes. There's a prototyping phase, which is kind of um, analogous to the experimental phase where you're testing and you're observing, and you're proposing changes and you're analyzing um, your, your, thing, your artifact that you're producing. And then you have a refinement and a delivery phase where you're polishing something and you actually deliver um, a completed artifact, uh, whether it be uh, a work of art or something that you've designed. What the design process and the art making process, a step that they also contain that the scientific method, uh, in my experience anyway, doesn't always contain, is this first component, which is the understanding, empathizing, learning, listening, translation, talking to humans, right? Thinking about human responses to the work. Um, how do humans need this? Do humans want this? How will humans engage with this? What is this going to do to the human imagination, right? There are, everything in our world is designed. There are some things that are well designed and there are some things that are not well designed. And the things that are well designed, probably the designer and the, and the art maker and the creative spend more time in this initial phase uh, understanding and empathizing and talking to actual human beings um, before they moved on to the, you know, the hypothesis or the ideation uh, phase of this. And so I would argue that if scientists worked with artists in this way and kind of incorporated this human-centered process, um, we may actually, um, you know, find that solutions to the climate crisis are not only easier to communicate, but they're also actually easier to solve. Um, and one way that I kind of approached this um, was I worked with a designer at, at JPL. While I was at SASC, I was working with a designer um, at JPL. So I want to talk about that project really briefly, and I just want to make sure that I still have enough time. Yes. Um, so uh, the motivation for this project um, came from uh, my experience uh, participating on the, the on the Oracle's field campaign, the NASA Oracle's field campaign um, in Namibia in 2016. Um, and while I was in Namibia, I had the opportunity also to travel to Zambia where I spoke with um, some local farmers who, um, and, and other um, you know, community members who engaged with, um, with burning and uh, fire, because I was, I was looking at fire um, aerosols specifically. And uh, one quote from uh, a guy named Chris Kayanesha really stands out to me and still stands out to me this day. We were talking about climate change and we were talking about all of these sorts of things. And uh, this is a paraphrase, but he essentially said, in 41 years, I never left Zambia, but these farms now are so dry this time of year. And it, it was, when I was there, it was um, September. It was late September. Um, he said, it doesn't rain anymore. We used to have rain in October and September. Now it's November. I don't know why, but we need water. It's so dry. I guess it's global warming, but all I know is that we need water in Lake Kariba or we won't survive, right? So we've got all these uh, words to describe the climate crisis. We've got a lot of science in the global north um, that describes the climate crisis, but how much time do we actually spend sort of uh, engaging with uh, folks who are sort of on the front lines of this type of thing? And so that was the motivation for, for me thinking about how art and science can combine to sort of produce a better product, um, so to speak. And so I'm gonna be talking briefly about this project, which I did, which of course involves uh, wildfire. Um, for those of you that knew me at UC Irvine, you know that, and, and when I went to JPL, that uh, for, for a decade or more, I studied wildfire, specifically aerosols from wildfire. And I obviously can't start a segment um, on wildfire without showing um, some work from one of my students. So here is a print of a California wildfire um, that one of my students made, my, my student Dakota Sherman made. Um, uh, very apocalyptic looking, but also really aesthetically beautiful, captivating. Um, so this figure from um, a Sally Archibald 2017 uh, paper looking at um, anthropogenic fire landscapes indicates 
where all of the fires on the planet are that are caused by humans. Um, that's what all the blue dots are, right? And so during my time at JPL, um, I, I worked on a project um, for multiple years where, and I actually worked with uh, two, two students who are, who are now um, in this department, um, Matt and Robert, um, who, who really were instrumental in helping me uh, with this project. We basically looked at every fire on the globe um, and using uh, the um, MISER uh, multi-angle imaging spectroradiometer satellite, um, we're able to see how high in the atmosphere the smoke coming from those fires goes, where it ends up in the atmosphere. And so um, there is a software program that was um, built and, and, and refined at JPL, which I had a hand in designing as well, um, which digitizes smoke plumes and then uh, using a stereoscopic algorithm computes how high in the atmosphere those smoke plumes actually are. Um, one of my first papers that I ever wrote as a grad student at JPL was actually using this uh, software. So when I got to JPL, uh, we set out to create the Miser Plume Hype Project, where we basically found every fire that we could see on the globe, every smoke plume. We digitized how high in the atmosphere the smoke plume went, um, and we created this global database. I think there's like five years worth of fire plumes in that database. Every plume on Earth, how high in the atmosphere those go. In my opinion, this is a very valuable data set. Um, it tells us a lot of information about where these aerosols are going, how high in the atmosphere they're going, has implications for transport, for atmospheric transport of aerosols, which can affect cloud formation, it can affect the radiation budget, and ultimately can affect um, surface and atmospheric temperatures and the climate. Um, and so while I was at JPL, we designed this website where we put, we dumped all of those plumes. Um, and so you can go to this website, or you could go to this website, and you could download any plume for any fire across the globe. Now, I'm talking to uh, what I assume are mostly scientists, and so we might all be looking at this website. So this is what the website uh, used to look like, and we might be thinking, it's okay. Um, if I show this to uh, a group of artists at, at, the, at the school I work at, for example, they're like, what the hell is this? Um, it's very confusing, it's not user-friendly, it makes no sense, it's really difficult to navigate. And so the end result was that really nobody was using these data. Nobody was using this data set that I collaborated with, with multiple undergraduate students at the time to build over the course of five years, um, very much a passion project for me. And so thinking about the intersection of art and science, I wrote a grant with some people at JPL um, where we were able to work with a design team to redesign this website. So in working with the design team, I got insight into how the design process actually works, how the art making process uh, actually works, right? As, per, per the sort of slide that I showed um, two slides ago um, with this sort of human engagement and then ideation, prototyping, Etc. Right, and so I'm just going to walk you through the process that we use um, to kind of give you some insight into how this both parallels and also is slightly different from the scientific method. So the first step, of course, is the contextual inquiry, understanding the people and the problem. And contextual inquiry is a design technique in which people are studied in their context of action in order to build a clear understanding of what they do and what they need. So for this particular project with the MISER team, this entailed multiple interview sessions, discussions, and workflow demonstrations with scientists and the designers themselves. I also should note that a lot of this work and a lot of these slides, um, I owe a lot to um, my, my collaborator and my colleague, Adrian Galvin, who uh, once we finished this project actually um, graduated with his master's in design and is now a full-time uh, designer at the Jet Propulsion Lab. So that's awesome. Um, so here's an example. Uh, I just show this because I think Adrian is like an incredible illustrator. These are some of his notes that he took during the contextual inquiry of this data set, of the MISER satellite, of this, how the smoke plumes work, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So then we move from the contextual 
uh, inquiry to the ideation sketching, to the sort of hypothesis phase, like what is this product gonna look like? What are we doing here? What are we after? So um, this first step, right, just like the hypothesis step in the scientific method, is sort of a low cost intuitive way to iterate on ideas, create, artifacts and hypotheses and other things that the team can respond to and have helpful conversations around. Many ideas are created and thrown away during this process, which saves the team effort. Very similar to, I think, sort of the, the hypothesis sort of part of, um, of the scientific method, right? So here's an example of the ideation phase. This is, you know, the designers thinking through what this updated website um, should look like. What can make it more user-friendly, um, more conducive to performing quality science. So then there's a lot of collaboration involved in the design process. So here's a picture um, of myself talking with one of our designers um, during this collaboration phase, right? Where we did a lot of, well, the designers anyway, did a lot of co-designing with scientists, showing sketches, sharing ideas, allowing us to give ideas to the designers of what we need, what we use, creating this novel visualization um, and working in close collaboration so that we can all make sure that we're on the right track, that we're all getting the result that we want. Then we move into the prototyping phase, right? So here's an example of sort of the first paper prototype and then there's a testing session. So it's very similar to what you might do during the experimental phase of the scientific method with um, and data analysis, collecting data, analyzing data, returning back maybe to the field to collect more data or rerunning the model with a slightly different perturbation, et cetera, et cetera, right? Then we moved from sort of paper prototypes to this digital prototype, and we hired a, a computer designer, a computer programmer to help us design a digital prototype. Here's the first digital prototype, then there's, we go back to the paper, we do a second uh, paper prototype. And when I say we, I mean the designers. Then we have another testing session, lots of collaboration here, lots of human involvement. Finally, we have another digital prototype. Um, and then we get to our results from this project. These are our actual results. So here's the, just to remind you, here's the, in, the website um, originally. Um, it's, it's not great. And that's a, was muted, okay. Um, so, so uh, sorry, I think I was briefly muted by accident. Um, so so uh, reminding you, here's the, the website originally. Um, not great, um, probably not conducive to, to, to performing good science. One of, the, one of the problems with this is that the website was so cumbersome to use, it wasn't aesthetic, it wasn't user-friendly, that there was a long uh, sort of uh, sort of lag time between, oh, I wanna do this, this research, this question, and then like, do I actually have the data? Can I obtain the data um, to do it, right? That's an unnecessary step that art and design can solve. And so here is what that website looks like now. Of course, this is a beautiful aesthetic rendering, but this is what the home screen of the website looks like. So when you log on to that website, you're immediately presented with um, visualizations of where all the plumes are. You can visualize um, X, Y plots that, that look at fire radiative power with relation to the maximum plume height, for example. You can look at uh, pie charts of, of where the plumes for a certain uh, time period are located, whether they're in Africa or South America or Boreal Eurasia. You can look at a, a visual map, like a map of, of Africa, for example, um, which is depicted in the right corner here, right? So this is all just, you go to that website and you can log in and instead of seeing, uh, you know, this, <laughs> uh, you see this instead and you get a lot of information right away. I get no information from this except that there might be some plumes and this is what, how they're divided up into these various color, um, colored geographical regions. Now I look at this, I can see, for example, in this depiction, um, you know, how many plumes, for example, are located in the Sudan based on the coloring of the bars. Um, I can look at the X, Y plots. I can subset data that I wanna eventually download to then 
do, you know, um, interrogate some scientific hypothesis on. I can um, bin the data by biome and I can zoom in and out. Um, and as I do that, the data rebins itself. So I get a really good initial um, look at the type of data that I'm after, right? So you can see how this would ultimately result in, um, sorry, this would ultimately result in possibly better science being done because we're skipping that step of like, what is this website? What data do I want? How do I wanna download it? What are the questions that I wanna ask with it? What do I wanna do? Now I can log in and I can just play around uh, with this interface and I can ask questions I can ask more questions. I can ask maybe better questions. And I've skipped that cumbersome step of like, where are the data and how do I download them? And what do they look like, right? And so we thought to um, explore this. Um, and this, this work is still ongoing. It hasn't been published yet, but ultimately we will be publishing this. Um, TBD where it's kind of difficult to find a journal that will accept collaboration sort of between designers, artists, and scientists. Um, but we did a controlled environment study with a few users of these data. Um, and Adrian created this insight process map, right, where he basically just watched what happened when we used um, the new website. Um, and, you know, as you can see here, he's kind of bended into um, periods where I was just clicking around or when one of the users was just clicking around to when we asked a question out loud, like, oh, maybe we can use these data to answer this question. And then we came up with a hypothesis. And, and then when we arrived at sort of a paper topic that we might be able to use. And so what we want to do is talk about this controlled environment study, right, in relation to how this plays out using the old website, which, um, you know, my guess, uh, and I think all of our guesses, is that the new website, the new aesthetic website, um, not only looks prettier and is more aesthetic and is easier to engage with, but it also leads us down a path of conducting better science. Um, that art and design have actually helped push us in the direction of asking better questions, asking more questions, um, and ultimately performing better science. So I think that art is really valuable, not only for communicating science, but also for doing uh, better science. And so this is my last slide. I always like to um, maintain optimism with all of my students. I think it's really important during these times uh, to maintain optimism, to, to, to convey uh, hope. And so I want to return to the sort of sentiments from that first quote from Parable of the Sower. Um, and I want to urge you all watching and, and, and for anyone really, that this isn't the end of the world, right? It's just the end of this world, this world that we've created, this world of climate crisis, um, this world of, you know, rising fascism, which may or may not be related to the climate crisis. So it's not the end of that world, it's just the end of this world. And this draws on the work of like Franz Fanon and other Afrofuturists and, and his contemporaries. Um, and I like to argue that we have a radical and revolutionary opportunity to make the next world, right, a better, brighter, more equitable one. But if we don't first imagine the future that we want, if we don't tap in to human imagination, then we will never have the future that we deserve. And we must, in order to get to this future, in order to build this next world, we must incorporate diverse voices. And this includes artists. And that's, this ultimately will help us get to the next world. So that is what I have. Uh, thank you very much. I guess maybe I'll take questions now. Awesome, thank you so much, Mika. Um, yeah, we'll open it up to questions. There are a lot of people here, so please use the raise hand feature. Um, and I can call on you if you click on the participants button at the bottom um, and then go over, you should be able to raise your hand on the right or type in the chat. And I also real quick, will advertise and put in the chat. We'll have a, a discussion after this seminar. We'll start at about two o'clock um, about being uh, queer in geosciences. So feel free to join us for that too. Um, I see uh, Venice has a question. Go ahead, Venice. Thanks, Mika, for a very interesting talk. Um, thank you so much. I really 
I enjoyed it and uh, I wasn't there from the beginning. I enjoyed it and I have some collaborations now with the arts department. Um, and so I'm very, very much interested in what you're, you, you're talking about here. Um, the question I have for you is that when you, when you redesign or when you, when you design, whether a website, when you use these tools, these aesthetic tools, whether it be a website or some ads, um, do you generally think of a specific audience or, or you're, you just, it's just generic with the assumption that um, all humans love aesthetic things? Um, so that, that's, a, that's the first one, but also as a follow-up question, um, have you had any response? I would like to, understand, to, to have an idea of your um, responses from policymakers. I mean, given the fact that in the time that we live in, and from, from my own experience, um, something that might be looked at as positive might have a backlash. So you can have, as you know, we have sometimes desirable <laughs> consequences of climate change, not always undesirable. And someone may use that um, um, against us to say climate change is good. So I would like to know, do you think about those different audiences and how do you incorporate that in your work? Yeah, that's um, it's a great question. And it's a super important one too. I think uh, I was just on a panel a couple of weeks ago with a climate scientist, Catherine Hayhoe. Uh, some of you may know her. Um, and she talks, she, she talks a lot about how communication of the climate crisis is really audience dependent, right? You have to meet your audience where they are um, instead of telling them what you think they wanna hear. So absolutely, I think when artists, designers, makers, creatives, are creating work, they are absolutely thinking about their art, their audiences. Um, and that is, uh, uh, yeah, plays into this work um, as well. So our audience for this website that I showed was scientists actually, right? So we were designing that website for use by scientists. So that's a little different than the artwork that my students are creating, which is to be used to sort of communicate climate change to a general audience. I think I often give them, the prompt is like, you're, you're trying to communicate to a high school audience or something, um, or a, an undergraduate college audience, like what is climate change? What is this thing that you're, you're, um, you're researching? So when I'm, when I'm uh, at the art school, we have to do um, critiques of artwork, um, all the faculty do, uh, where we basically look at art that students are making and we talk about it for like 30 minutes. Um, and it's a critique and they get kind of graded on it. It's like a whole thing. Um, and one of the questions that inevitably always gets asked is who is your audience and why are you making this for them? Why, or, or not, why do you not care about them? Um, right, because there's, there's sort of like two sides to that, to that coin. So absolutely audience is like very, 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 very important. And it's definitely a consideration um, for these types of projects. Yeah, great question, thanks. Um, also, I'm just reading through the chat um, and Someone asked if there what visual, data visualization software was uh, used, and it was written from scratch. Yeah, it was. Uh, we had a computer scientist who wrote it from scratch. Um, so I just wanted to clear, clarify that. Great. Yeah, there's a couple other questions in the chat um, from Dylan about making it uh, more accessible for people not in in the art scene. Um, for example, coal miners um, don't often um, frequent the the Brooklyn art scene. So this is why this is a really important question. I think like, um, again, audience is important here. Um, I, while I was at JPL and now at SAIC, two separate people were working on a project um, to, to um, bring sea level data to indigenous communities in the Arctic um, on their phone, on an app. Right, and so this is really important information for uh, indigenous communities who who use the Arctic Ocean for hunting whales, um, which is a way in which they sustain their livelihoods. And because of the retreat of sea ice earlier in the year, which they typically would, you know, walk out on to go um, spear whales, um, that sea ice is no longer there. Right, they're really engaged with um, what's happening to the Arctic sea ice, and so you might not think of this as art. Um, but I think of it as art. I think of it as an aesthetic sort of a scientist making that app. It's not going to be, uh, it's not going to achieve necessarily the same end goal if there's no uh, collaboration with or, or focus on 
um, who's going to be using it and why are they going to be using it? Why are they engaging with it? Right. And so I agree, like, uh, making, making high art, making fine art is not always going to work, um, in this context. Right. But art comes in many different, uh, forms. I had one student who, um, for their final project, they picked up trash in Grant Park on, on, on Lake Michigan and filmed it. Right. And, uh, while they were doing it, they engaged with people who were walking by, who were visiting the park, and talked about climate change, talked about the Anthropocene, um, talked about all these things. So we might not think of that as art necessarily, um, but I can guarantee you that the art world thinks of that as art. And um, I think of it as art because art is just, is, is, I mean, it's very cliche to say, but art is sort of anything, right? It's, 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 uh, it's this sort of like something that captures the human imagination um, in important ways, in sort of visceral ways. And so, yeah, I agree, like uh, having a, you know, fine art exhibit is not always going to, to be enthralling to, to coal miners uh, in West Virginia, but perhaps some other um, embodiment of art or some other ar aesthetic representation will. And so that's really important. It goes hand in hand with the audience question. Any other questions? Yeah, hi, my, Mika, this is Charlie. Hi, Charlie. Uh, I do exist, hi. One of the things you opened your talk with was the question of are we, are humans uh, separate from or identical with or part of nature? And, um, you know, my person, I wanted to ask you, because your perspective seemed to be that, of course, we are. <laughs> I wanted to confess that I, I had the opposite response to your question, and it was uh, that I don't feel, <clears throat> especially in the constructed environment, a part of nature very often. Mm -hmm. And isn't it the one of the tragedies of of civilization that we are so distant uh, and so oftenly distant? from nature that we don't understand uh, climate change to the extent that those who are still living on the land do uh, understand and feel and resonate with changes in the seasonality of, of the environment that they live in. Uh, I think that played out very much in your redesign of the website, uh, how you went from that rectilinear impossible Mercator projection that like no human being has ever seen. It's completely a projection is the right word for it. It's it's not even a uh, it can never really be be seen by human eyes um, in 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 reality. And you've changed it. And your opening screen now is full of rounded corners and aesthetic judgments. And you have that 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 stereoscopic point of view, which kind of re-encapsulates the data set itself, mm -hmm. right? The stereo vision of Miser. So I think that um, what you've demonstrated is how, how wide a leap it would be for us who are so far so often from uh, nature to kind of get to that perspective and why a, a great web designer or artist would work so well with scientists. Yeah, I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I may have like, maybe not fully kind of explained. I agree with you completely. I do think most humans like to say that they're part of nature because they hold this like mythical idea, idea, ideal, idealized sort of like relationship that they have with nature. But I do think in our practical lives, we are very separate from nature. And that's actually the issue, right? Is that we think we're part of it, but we're not actually. Like we don't, we don't really engage with it. We don't really know about it. We don't really know what's going on. And so we do have to get back to actually being a part of it, right? So it's like exactly what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. There's typically when you, when, uh, when I ask this question, like to a room full of, of people, like 95% of them will say that they are part of nature, which is interesting to me because like, I would say in practical material realities, most humans don't actually think that they're part of nature. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in this like apartment, I've got all these plants behind me, but they're all in pots. Like what is, 
what is nature like what is my relationship with nature right so it's like it's it's a very complicated thing but you're absolutely right in that caps recapturing our imagination and bringing us kind of back to nature which we fundamentally want to be a part of then that could go a long way philosophically speaking, to like you know reconnecting us with the the climate crisis i have my students read the uh the book the end of nature by bill mckibben i don't know if anyone in here has read it hopefully people have read it. it's a great book it's an oldie but it's a goodie um and he talks about this this problem in philosophical philosophical sort of framing uh quite extensively yeah well if we felt we were part of nature then perhaps we would act more responsibly so it's a really important uh, message that you're sending yeah thank you yeah can i pick back on that thought yeah. and, sure. and bring it closer to science um what are your views on the possibility of evolving um the epistemology you know of, of science of scientific thinking so that we also, just like we're talking about the disconnect between humans and nature, we can also talk a little bit about the disconnect between science and society. Science, and, and as you know, we, of course, we try to eliminate any source of bias, but over the years, we have been questioning whether or not it's better to just embrace that we are as scientists, humans, and, and by default, filled with biases and, and preconceived notions that we have to kind of get rid of before we can actually uh, commit to this scientific approach that is unbiased. So when you talk about art, it makes me think of, of the importance of incorporating emotion, not maybe not incorporating, but embracing, acknowledging <laughs> the fact that, that um, emotions play a big role in what we do as scientists as well. You yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always say to my students, that um, science is not, doesn't happen in a vacuum. Science happens in a society and science happens by people. It's done by people. And so I don't know, I'm not a, necessarily like a scientific historian slash philosopher. So I don't really know how we got to this point where we've sort of internalized and, and tried to embody this like scientist as unbiased observer. Um, I don't necessarily think that scientists are always unbiased observers. We try as hard as we can. Um, but I think if we embrace the fact that we are not unbiased observers, then we might be able to do um, better science. Yeah, and I think that one of the ways that we do that is by engaging with these diverse voices um, and, 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 and like sort of thinking through, uh, thinking through what that means to, 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 to do science, you know, in this in this era, uh, which is very different than how science, you know, and again, I'm not a science historian, so I can't speak on this like with expertise. But it's very it's very different than historically how science has been done during different periods. It's always changing. Um, yeah, and I also want to piggyback on that. There's a question in the chat about how um, designers and artists can learn from scientists, and I think that probably the most important way that that designers and artists and creatives can can learn from scientists is through actually the same uh, sort of research method, scientific process, whatever, right? So while we're learning from, from designers, there is this element, all my students sort of learn in my classes, like what it means to, to do scientific research, which is similar to artistic research, but also very different in, in, in one critical way that it's different um, is that scientists, I think, because we've internalized this like role as the unbiased observer, we tend to kind of try and look at all the available evidence, right? Everything that we possibly can get our hands on. Um, that's why scientific papers have like 60 citations, you know? Um, and, so, and so I think artists um, are really learning about that process by through collaboration uh, with scientists. I also think there's a more practical thing in that my students and artists and creatives and designers in general just learn about scientific topics. You know, they learn about um, environmental disaster, Anthropocene, climate change, et cetera, et cetera, um, from scientists. And so there's kind of like two, two, two points there. Carl? Hey, Mika, 
great talk. I really loved it. Um, I had a question because uh, you made a, a lot of really strong arguments about why scientists and artists should collaborate. But in our grad student lunch, you mentioned about how we're very siloed in our own disciplines. And I was just curious what your thoughts on how to make those um, collaborations happen are. Yeah, okay, so that's a that's a good, <laughs> good question. Um, and one that I don't know I have like a great answer for. Um, one way that we can make those collaborations happen um, is, is, is with more money, um, more funding. And, you know, institutions, our government, funders, et cetera, need to make this a priority, I think. They need to make this, what I call radical, radically interdisciplinary collaboration, less radical and more normalized. Um, so I do think money is like um, kind of a limiting factor here. I know, uh, especially artists are, uh, you know, often, uh, not paid, not compensated well for their work. And I think, um, you know, they're, they're used to doing these things ad hoc or sort of like for, for a discount. Um, but I don't think that that's the way to approach this, uh, necessarily. Um, there was also something else I was going to say to this, but now I've like, it slipped my mind. Um, but I do think, I do think like these types of collaborations are possible. Sometimes it's just like as simple as, talking to an artist um, and, and seeing where, where their head is at and collaborating with an artist. I obviously am in a very privileged position in that all of my students are artists. And so they come and talk to me and there's, as you can see, there's a lot of work that they've done. There's a lot of work that, like the, the Jimi Hendrix uh, remix, as I call it, um, carbon dioxide remix was an independent project that my student did. Another student of mine um, who's really interested in techno music um, held a, a a, a Zoom panel earlier in the spring um, where we talked to some techno producers and DJs about how techno music and climate change intersect, right? And so a lot of it is talking um, and, and with each other about these things. Um, a lot of it is uh, letting go of stereotypes and preconceived notions about what artists are or if you're an artist, what scientists are. Um, these types of things, yeah. So I don't know that there's an easy answer for it, but I'm, it's something that I'm like going to spend the rest of my career thinking about, so. <laughs> yeah. Great, well, thanks so much. It's two o'clock, so we'll, uh, we'll end there. We'll give another round of virtual applause uh, for Dr. Tosca and anyone's welcome to join us at the post-discussion in five or so minutes. Thank you. Yeah.